I want to make sure we spend at least a little bit of time talking about hope, right? So we, we mostly talk about challenges in this class and because we're trying to understand that there's these, these uh, hills we have to climb and all that kind of good stuff. Um, but do not leave here thinking that coastal management is a total death spiral. We can't do anything, right? I think we've seen several examples over the course of the semester of ways that we're, we're um, uh, a ch a changing our behaviors, changing our management um, for the better. Things aren't perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but things are getting better. I would offer a few examples of successes would be um, coastal water quality. Is our, our, our coastal water is perfect now? Absolutely not. 100 years ago, though, if we went and jumped in the water in Santa Monica Bay, you could easily get uh, an infectious disease, swimming through poop and, and just horrible, horrible water quality, right? So, so it's important to acknowledge that while we're not perfect, we've, we've done a huge job. We've come a huge distance in terms of improving um, offshore water quality here in California, for example. Dealing with the ozone hole, right, which again was was the challenge when I was in your shoes, that was the thing that was going to end the world, right? Where everybody's freaked out about the ozone hole. The ozone hole still exists, and it's not really a hole, it's just a thinning. But, but the ozone hole still exists, but we've taken international collaborative voluntary uh, uh, approaches through the Montreal Protocol to phase out the most destructive of these chemicals, right? And so, so things are getting better in terms of this vast... A distributed problem that at first people thought we weren't going to be able to solve. We've done, um, we've made some progress at combating invasive species. We saw, um, for example, we saw the, um, the plateaus around the Piedras Blancas lighthouse that, that 20 years ago was, was full of South African invasive plants. Now it's full of our native dominated plants, so much so that we had a, we have to have a little box to show people what the bad guy looks like because people that are visiting from other other parts of the country don't even know what it looks like. Um, the California Coastal Act, I would argue, is another um, a, a, a massive success. Is it perfect? By no means. Does the Coastal Commission cause problems and have issues? Absolutely. But we're so much better having this uh, than were we to have not had this key piece of coastal management policy and legal frameworks. Um, and then I would also just talk about fisheries, and we'll talk about a couple examples of successful things in fisheries in a second. Um, uh, I would just you know, also remind you guys that the coast is real, right? Some people would have you believe that it's just, uh, it's just um, you know, a, a, a weird political thing, and there's weird people, but it, it explains a lot of stuff. In this case, this is COVID cases, right? We can see the middle of the country is one color. The coasts are different. People behave differently. We have different income levels, all that kind of good stuff. Um, uh, yeah, the coast is real. We still have challenges. These are folks that are out there harvesting stuff. Um, we see it in whatever we want to pick. In this case, this, was, this is voting habits, right? Very different in the coast versus uh, inland in terms of our own state. Um, but generally, we do know what to do, right? Generally, we do. We, we, were t we talked for a bit about uh, managed retreat and, and coastal erosion and all that kind of stuff, right? One of the best examples for how to deal with erosion is right here in our own backyard, Surfers Point. People use this example all across the nation to talk about how you can deal with eroding coastlines, rising sea levels, etc. And again, we just simply ripped up our infrastructure that was already crumbling, moved it inland, and then made it safer so that people could ride their bikes without falling in the water, made it safer for people to recreate, kids to walk on the, the, you know, walk to the beach, all that kind of good stuff. And we also restored some of the ecosystem, right? And we installed a living shoreline to be more naturally dynamic as the sea rises. So this can work. Again, this is, this is uh, Huntington Beach um, 75 years ago, right? Um, those are all oil derricks. Um, we've gotten a little bit better, right? I would argue um, with that. Um, and we've also gotten a bit better in terms of managing our human activities on the beach. This again is another picture from about 100 years ago where <clears throat> when we didn't have much regulation and everybody just come and plop down and, and you know, do what you want to do. 
coastal access remains a huge challenge. Maybe some of you are working with Dr. Reinemann or Dr. Patch on this um, important issue. Um, but, but it's an issue because we have permission. You have permission guaranteed in our state constitution to access your coast. Other parts of the world, unfortunately, don't have that, that luxury. So this is, this is an effective approach to dealing with overdevelopment and exclusion of people from the ocean, et cetera. Okay, so, so fisheries, right? We've talked about this. This is the classic picture. Things start off and we, get, we have a, a high amount of biomass harvest. <clears throat> And then as we go through time, um, we, we take more and more, like, hey, this is great. And we take some more and more, hey, this is great. And then all of a sudden, uh, it crashes, right? So this general uh, uh, pattern of depletion is seen all around. And we'll hear in a, in a few minutes about abalone and what happened with those guys, but same thing. Now, when we see this, and we see these pictures, and you hear these factoids, like there's going to be more pieces of plastic in the ocean than fish in 2050. It's not true. That's not true. But, um, but, but th those things kind of scare us, right? It's important that you all, as you know, graduates of our program, you have to, uh, we have to understand that these challenges out there, they can be depressing. But we can look at those challenges and we can either stick our head in the sand and just say, oh my God, the world's ending, and pretend there's no problem, or just give up and drink our lives away, or whatever it is. Or we can actually say, okay, yep, real problem opportunity here. It's an opportunity to fix things, to make things better. That's jobs for you guys, that's opportunity for you guys, and that's also opportunity to be inventive and to, and to be, you know, an, an articulate, um, effective arguer for an alternative path. And so that's um, perhaps what we've seen with our uh, network of marine protected areas around the state. So let's talk about some examples. Um, of, of successes. I don't have the most recent data in here, but, but I'll just say that the data have, have continued to get better. So this is one of our, our largest local fish species. This is white sea bass. Uh, when I was an undergrad, this is my summers, this is mostly, or this is one of the most common fish that I ate, because I was out living on Catalina Island doing research, and we would basically get our dinner most nights. Um, and so this was a popular fish, and it's, it is, it remains a popular fish, both for people pole fish, fish and line fishing, but also um, we would spear fish. So we, we would, um, this is a very popular target for spear fishermen and fisherwomen uh, in uh, our part of the world. And so it, uh, it followed some of that, that similar path we've talked about. So way back when, in the 30s, we were, you know, we're catching some of these sea bass. And again, remi reminding you guys, this is landings data, right? This is not how many number of fish, nobody's out there counting the number of fish that were actually out there. We're counting the landings data. And so that's, that's tied up with the issue of catch per unit effort, how many people were, were, were going after the fish and all that kind of stuff. So with the acknowledgements that this is, this is potentially, you know, problematic data, this is how many metric tons of white sea bass we we're landing here in California, and this is primarily Southern California waters, this species. So, okay, getting stuff, getting stuff, getting stuff. After World War II, I'll start doing some more, and then all of a sudden, whoom, explosion of harvesting. And then we start declining, right, down that same old exploitation curve. Uh, but um, we're not down at that level like we were, um, you know, a couple decades ago. Things are actually improving. And again, I, I said I didn't have the most recent data. We, we have more data that it's continuing to go up. So, what, do you, what might that be? What do you guys think maybe happened in 92, 92, 96, early 90s? Uh, yeah, good guess, good guess. In this case, no, but, but, but excellent guess. The MPAs come in as a big, robust network about 10 years after this. Uh, no, what, do anybody, anybody remember the year of the Endangered Species Act? It was in the 70s? 1973, 1973. We, we, have, we have a California Endangered Species Act and we have the state and we have the federal, but, but yeah, 1973 for the federal. So um, yeah, no, okay, okay, but good guesses. So it was a policy, it was a policy change.
it was, it's a it's a it's a state policy. This is prop a proposition prop one thirty two, and this banned gill nets, gill nets and trammel nets. But but for the purpose of today, basically uh, gill nets starting January first, nineteen ninety four. In coastal waters of central and southern California, so uh, you know Catalina, uh, 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 the islands, um, you know Ventura, <clears throat> etc. Um, and also, we have a new fee that was levied, starting in 1995, to help with the recovery of this species, to provide some funding, dedicated funding for the recovery which was uh, a fish hatcheries and, and, and things of that nature. I'm just going to check and make sure that I didn't get a text from Jenny. Okay, cool. So, yeah, right. So, th so that, that's when the gill net ban. And somebody remind me what gill nets do? Somebody, somebody tell me about gill nets. So the, the way the net is structured is like the fish goes in and their, uh, their gills, like if they try to get out of the net by backing up or backing away, right. their gill will get caught in the net. And so they can't move. Right, exactly. So, so like this torpedo-shaped fish, right? So the gill nets are usually monofilament, so very hard to see, very, almost invisible. Um, and so the fish is swimming, 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 or, or the organism is swimming, 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 and all of a sudden, boop! You know, before you know it, your head, because most of these fish are torpedo-shaped, your head pops through it, and you're like, oh, crap, and you get stuck, right? It, it goes, your head goes through, but your, your fins, let's say, don't get through it. And you're like, oh, damn. And then, you tr then the fish will try to back up, and because they have these opercula, they have these, these covers over their gills, right? That tends to get stuck, and j j just like, like a butterfly uh, screw or something. Like, oh, and he's stuck, and now he can't go forward, can't go back, and he's, and he's stuck, right? And, and, then, and then when the net's full, you feel something tug on the net, then you pull the net in, and, and it's a way of passively fishing. Um, so yeah, so stuff starts coming up, coming up, and, and sure enough, when we um, look at the, the recovery, what we see is the catch per unit effort is getting better, right? So for every unit effort, that could be person uh, hour on the water, that could be hour of boat time, um, number of poles in the water, whatever, whatever the metric you want to use is. In this case, it's standardized as the metric ton per vessel fishing for the, the critter. It's going up, right? Now the first little bit, the eight, check it out. So here, here it's kind of bouncing around. It's kind of pretty much stable. It's like up a little bit, down a little bit. But then, right, the gill net band goes into effect here. It takes these individuals a few years to get to the adult size that we catch them, right? So there's always a little bit of a lag. It's not an instantaneous thing. But sure enough, oh, like a boop, 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 boop. By the time the early 2000s, we're starting to go up, go up, go up, and we've been going up. Uh, and we continue to go up. So that's a success, um, and a success both for commercial and recreational. In fact, the world, uh, the, we, we, might, we might have had a new record in the last couple of years since COVID, but I haven't checked, but, but before COVID, this remained the world record white sea bass um, uh, caught on by a spear fisherman, 92 pound fish, which is a huge fish. Look how big that fish. Now fishermen always, if you guys don't fish, they always hold the fish out way in front of them and so it looks bigger in the camera. But even this one, this guy can barely hold it up, right? So he's not holding it four feet in front of him. He's kind of like, and it's huge, right? So, so, you know, by, you know, a decade or so later, these fish are growing to larger sizes, which is, which is great. So white sea bass looks like a success story. I would say it is a success story in terms of better management. Um, what have the hatcheries done? Mm, it, mm, it's the hatcheries or the evidence that the hatcheries are really playing a huge difference is a bit hard to really suss out, but it appears to be the lack of the gill nets is really the, the key success story. But both those things were happening. Okay, that's one example. Here's another great success story. Um, uh, when I grew up, we called these black sea bass. Now we call them giant sea bass. Um, but these guys were the apex predator of our reef. Let me, make, let me make this clear. This is a big honking fish. So I've only seen a big, the biggest one I've ever, oh, the largest individual I've seen is a juvenile. 
and it looked to be about the size of a VW Bug, right? I mean, it was huge. It was huge. These guys are these big, giant groupers that swim around and have this big, huge mouth, and it's like a vacuum cleaner, and they go, Whoa! and they just suck in whatever the hell's in front of them. Lobster, eat the lobster. Crab, eat the crab. Fish, eat the fish. Uh, you know, like they just, they just plow, and they are massive. So the one that I saw, I almost messed my pants underwater when I was, I was carrying concrete blocks <clears throat> for my PhD experiment. So I would take these heavy things and rock it to the bottom of the ocean, and then I would moonwalk, take my fins off and moonwalk them, and I'd have to look down so I wouldn't trip over rocks as I was carrying this stuff underwater. And so I would always be looking down and I got to the edge of this kelp bed on the backside of Catalina one day. And I looked up and right in front of me, like, like three feet in front of me was this big, huge, I thought it was a sea monster at first. I was like, what? It's about to eat me, right? And just sort of sitting there, you know, kind of like tail slowly wagging, just like looking at me like, what the hell is that, right? Am I gonna eat that? No, nah, I don't think I wanna eat that. And then, and you know, amazing. And that was probably about half the size of a full grown, uh, full grown mature individual um, a, a giant sea bass. So same thing, yeah, Claire. Uh, it's estimated that a giant black sea bass is capable of growing a length of over seven feet and weighing over 700 pounds. Largest species ever caught by a sport fisherman, rod and reel, weighing 563 pounds, was caught off of Manicapa Island in 1968. Look at that, right there, right there. Good call. Excellent. Thank you for the Frank. Thank you for the fact check. Yeah. Yep. That's good. These are these are large-bodied individuals, and so, but the seven feet is a little bit. I mean, yeah. So seven feet, like, it's taller than me, right? But they're this girth, right? I mean, it's like it's it's seven feet and like a bah, It's big. It is a big a big organism, and these used to be all over the place, all up and down our coast. Again, same old story. We had, uh, you know, we started catching them, then caught some more, and caught some more, and caught some more, then caught a bunch, and then. Boom, right? Um, uh, another example would be uh, some of our sharks. In this case, this is a soup fin shark. Uh, this is a leopard shark. Um, uh, uh, another common uh, nearshore species. Leopard sharks are one of the things, if you guys recall from our visit to Diablo Canyon, one of the species that, would, that likes the warm water in and around the little um, uh, protected uh, harbor that we, we toured and visited. Um, uh, I could talk to you guys about leopard sharks for a long time, but anyway, so, so leopard sharks. Um, I just say leopard sharks don't bite you. Leopard sharks eat um, snails, crabs, and stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, all these guys, again, way back when, caught a lot of these, and then numbers going down. But after the early, mid-2000s, I mean, excuse me, mid-1990s, right, we, with all these things, black sea bass, these sharks, we're starting to see greater catch per unit effort, meaning for the same amount of effort we put in, we're getting more fish biomass out, right? And we see that over and over again. And so, for example, these guys are really charismatic. These, these, these um, giant sea bass babies are very, very cute. They do not look like they're adults. They're spotted. They hang out over sandbars, in, in sand, like off our sandy beaches. They're very... Um, when you see them, they're very obvious as to what they are. You can't mistake them for anything else. Um, <clears throat> and for years, we didn't see any of them. Um, this, was, this fish was um, uh, uh, covered with the Endangered Species Act, um, and that didn't seem to help. The gill net closures go in again in the mid-90s, and initially nothing happens, and then we start seeing the babies being born. Now we actually have a, a statewide project where recreational, you know, scuba divers, snorkelers, surfers, if you see one of these things, you can report it as a citizen science, and we're finding these critters are showing up all over the place, right? We still don't have a huge number of the big giant ones because they live for decades and decades, right? But we're seeing more and more of these individuals come into the system. And that's a success story. That's a management success story. So this notion that we don't know how to manage fisheries is bunk. We do. We just need to have the discipline and, and the appropriate um, response. So these species aren't fully recovered yet by any stretch of the imagination, but they are recovering. They are recovering. 
And so with all these issues, with all these uh, topics and challenges, it's really, really key that you guys stay involved. So don't look at these management challenges and say, ah, can't do anything about it. Yes, it might be very hard, but all of these things are solvable. We caused all of these challenges. We can get ourselves out of all of these challenges. So um, fisheries, while they can seem very daunting and, and very problematic and we're over harvesting and all this and that, but, um, but tools like reducing our, our intensity of take, tools like marine protected areas really do seem to be helping in stabilizing populations and getting us to a better state. We have a long way to go, but we do see positive signals from these particular management decisions we're making. Cool? Mm -hmm. All right, uh, questions. So stay engaged, you guys are engaged, stay engaged. Uh, questions? Yes. 